Hey, John, thank you very much indeed for agreeing to talk to the Marlborough Oral History Project about your lives in Marlborough. If I can start with you, Peg, can you tell me how life began for you in Marlborough? I was born at 143 High Street because my father was in France in the war. He didn't see me for nine months. I yelled for the first nine months of my life. And then about 1920, we moved to 5 High Street uh, behind our ready money shop. Very ancient place. There wasn't a, uh, a level floor in the house at all. We had great fun and I don't quite know how old I was, but under 12 when we had a fire one Sunday morning. The chimney caught fire. The fire brigade came put the hose up the chimney and the water never came back. And then they discovered that there was a, a chimney breast going from down in the cellars where it had been a bakery at one time. We didn't know that. It's where the council offices are now. And at the end of the long passage going in on the right, they pulled that down to let my pram through. And there was an old settle just in the corner which they discovered. I went to school when I was five, to the high school, which is now behind the photographic shop. Alice Brawson and uh, Miss Hillier ran it. I stayed there till I was 12, and then I went to Western Supermare to boarding school. Was it a mixed school? It was at number five. It wasn't at Western. That was a girls' school. My brother went also to school in Western Supermare, and he was allowed out. And he used to come and see me on Mondays. Had special permission. We met in the drawing room. You devil. Yeah. <laughs> was it a fairly large school? Oh, I suppose there were about 25 of us probably at the high school. Mm. Quite a small affair. Which, which yes, as far as I can remember. Yes, there was an up and a down. And do you recall whatever happened to the building? Well, I know it became the Red Cross building afterwards because I took a Red Cross course there about 1960. And did you like your school days? Yes, I yelled for three days. I cried for three days when I went to boarding school. But I loved it and I think I cried more when I left. But I was very happy. Just before we move on, um, you mentioned where you were born, but uh, you didn't mention the names of your parents. Richard Mundy, commonly known as Dick, and Hilda Mundy. Now on to you, John. When did you first come to Marlborough? In 1935, from Hartenden, Hertfordshire. I would have been four. Where did you move to when you first came to Marlborough? We first lodged in George Lane. Then for a while we were in Polton House, the back of Polton House. And in December 1936, we moved into the rest house on Polton Hill. And we moved over here in 73. What made your parents move to Marlborough? Well, father got a, a job as bailiff down on Polton Farm for a Mr North. What age did you start school? Uh, I'd be five then. And, and where I'd did be, you go to? I went to St Mary's Infants. And then down to St Peter's to the boys' school. Where was St Mary's Infants at the time? In Heard Street. From St Peter's I went to the grammar school. And in 1946 I went into boys' service at Arborfield. Mm -hmm. Going back to your schooling, the school at St Mary's, was that a mixed school? Uh, yes, at that yeah. time, yeah. And they integrated you all, you, you weren't kept separate? So I see in a lot of these old school buildings you have a boy's entrance and a girl's entrance and it very much suggests that they're trying to keep you apart. No, we were and, uh, mixed in the infant school, yeah. but it was all boys at St Peter's yeah. and yeah. then mixed again at the grammar school. Yeah. Where was St Peter's when you went to school? In the library. Where the library is Where now? the library is now, yeah. yeah. How would you say it differs the most compared to how it is now? The layout is much the same. Mm -hmm. uh, the playground is is now blocked off, but I, I think that's been built on now. Mm -hmm. A top playground and a lower playground in those days. Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy your schooling? 
Mm, not all that much. No. <laughs> not I was, does. I was a free man and away. Yeah. If I was in trouble, I'd keep away from home. <laughs> 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 Going through the war years, you see, yeah. so we were up to mischief all the time. Okay. Where was the grammar school when you went? In the parade. Oh, where St. Peter's Junior's Where St. Peter's Junior's yeah. yeah. now. So when you went to school then, John, what, what did you used to get up to? All sorts. It was the war years, so we were freelance and went where all the troops were and uh, any houses in Marlborough where they'd been billeted. We used to be in there to see what we could find and up on the common. It must be quite exciting times for... Uh, well, we, we, we were never without something to do. <laughs> Early part of the war, the troops were under canvas. Um, we used to go tent sliding. In other words, climb up on the marquees and sit on the top roof <laughs> on the ridge. And there was a, a sneaky corporal who used to come round and try and get in the marquee with a... A big stick and <laughs> whack our backsides. <laughs> so we used to hightail on top on the ridge yeah. and hang on till he went. <laughs> <laughs> Where were the troops billeted in Marlborough? In the big houses. The Home Guard had top of uh, Kingsbury Street. What's the home at the top of Bird Street? Highfield. Highfield. Home Guard had that place, and uh, that was their headquarters for a while. Down the uh, rectory, down the bottom end of the high street, opposite St. Peter's Church, know, the they were in there. Yeah. You know, all the big houses that were yeah. empty, they used to move in the uh, troops in there and billet them, you know, early part of the war. That's when the uh, bays and the the carabineers were here with tanks. There was uh, the very cold winter in 1940 when it rained and froze at the same time. Tanks were sliding all over the place and the troops were sitting on their tin plates on the top side of the high street and going the, across to their meal place at the bottom of sitting on the tin plates. The Yanks used to frequent the uh, Royal Oak and it was at the time when they had black troops over to sort the ammunition and stuff up, out up at the forest and there was an <laughs> incident where the, the blacks were upstairs and <laughs> the snowdrops or the military police tried to get in to throw them out of the pub and they tried to push the piano down the stairs on <laughs> on the snowdrops and they tried to get up there. So what did wartime Marlborough look like? Was it very different? Well, you got to either end of the car park, there was a, st a round static water tank and another one in the green. They were scared of the uh, place catching fire if it was ever bombed. Whereabouts was it on the green, job? On the lower side of the uh, avenue of trees, if you look there, you can see a, a worn patch where the uh, chalk came through. And down the river, they put a series of hatches in to hold the water back in case they wanted to uh, tackle fires, you know, having the, a source of water from the river. When the evacuees came down, there was Mrs. Biggs and her family. Uh, the women folk were plaiting camouflage nets and they used to string them up between the trees, the uh, lime trees, and plait the uh, strips of camouflage in. And they used them up in the forest to cover up the ends of the uh, D huts where they used to keep the ammunition. It was mainly uh, 25 pounder shells and that sort of thing in there. Oh, there's a very big depot up there. And there's the old fashioned Romneys. They had Romneys sunk in the ground 
and uh, a wall either end to stop blast in case they were bombed and they reckoned there was enough gas stored in those places during the war if the wind had been in the right direction and they'd been bombed we'd have all been gassed in Marlborough and there was a case where a train load of ammunition in the siding up on the uh, railway side uh, Salisbury Road end this train caught fire we, they never really found out how it caught fire but uh, probably a brake running hot or something like that you mentioned and the railways how were the railways used during the war? Well, uh, during the war, of course, you've got the Americans coming over from uh, the States, landing in Liverpool, being trained down to Swindon, and then on the local branch line, which went down from Swindon down, right through to Andover, and they'd be uh, transported right down to Andover, and Luggishall and all around there, and billeted in tents. So there was a, you know, a terrific amount of military goings on, you know, down Luggershall Way. And what was the common use for during the war? Common was uh, uh, eventually they built a, a hospital there to uh, take casualties from, well, they started coming in directly after D-Day. Hmm. And, you know, it was... Uh, the first wake-up call that I got that uh, something big was going on because there was a fleet of their four-man ambulances came in from uh, the airfield at Ramsbury and I suppose a, a convoy of about ten or a dozen came in all closed up so that you couldn't see what was going on and they finished up on the common and you know, they carried out operations as necessary. And I think uh, something like 60,000 casualties went through the hospital up there. And the whole time that that was running, only two died. So they had a pretty good record. It's incredible, isn't it? Mm. No MRSA then, was there? Nope. No, no. <laughs> There was a Dakota came down on the Ramsbury side of the Red Line at Axford, narrowly missing the uh, houses. And there's a memorial to that crew that obviously all died in the car park at the Red Line. And then there was another one came down, I think it was a Blenheim, came down and sputtered across the railway the far side of the uh, tunnel about half a mile towards Savanac from the tunnel and uh, we got up there a bit late and most of the wreckage had been carted away but we found uh, a flying boot with a foot still in it and a scalp and there was a hedge about 50 metres on the western side of the railway and all the blood and gore was spattered all along this edge so it was a pretty horrendous crash but as I say we were a bit late getting up there so I didn't see much and there was another instant where uh, sticker bombs were dropped up over Rockley over the back of Rockley they had a dummy aerodrome that looked much like a a chicken coop that they used to light up at night. There was a stick of bombs dropped across this thing. Didn't actually hit it, but uh, uh, about four or five bombs and a can of oil, I suppose it must have been. You know, that was the uh, dummy airfield doing its job. Uh, did they, the, did they bomb the, the Eagle pub down there? No, there was a bo bomb fell smack in the middle of the road up from the uh, rocky what was the old eagle pub and um, there's a straight bit which goes up towards Marlborough and the, a bomb fell smack in the middle of the road and there was an old chap driving along and he heard the siren go so he drove with no headlights 
and went straight down the hole. <laughs> <laughs> was that as close as a bomb ever got to Marlborough? That must have been about the closest one. There was a, a bomb hole. It wasn't a big one. I suppose it was about four or five foot across. Yeah. Fell behind the targets and the stop butts, the rifle range in the butts, you know, over the back of the common. Yeah. It was the uh, college rifle range. Yeah. And uh, originally it went back to 800 yards. It was the start of National Rifle Association shooting when they used to compete at, at Wimbledon on Wimbledon Common from 1860 onwards. And then 1890 they moved down to Bisley. As kids we used to go looking for bullets, bullet cases, and anything, you know, to do with the war. Wellingtons used to tow targets over for training gunners, and you'd hear the odd ping where a clip had fallen down, and these planes used to tow the targets, and the trainee machine gunners used to have a go at it. The Marlborough's fairly central in the general scheme of things. Was there a lot of planes flying over the town during the war to get to bigger places? Yeah. Up on the top of Polton Down was Warren Farm. Early part of the war, they dug a series of 14, 18 zigzag type trenches yes. in the form of a square and threw a lot of chalk up. And they suddenly discovered that the Germans coming up from Southampton, Salisbury Cathedral Spire, and then this great area of chalk showed up, and they were using it as the marker. markers to go up to the Midlands. So you could quite often see planes flying over around this area, and the, the, well, si and the siren would often go off in Marlborough, I assume, yeah, as a result. You know, if there was a plane went over, we'd all rush out and see what it was. Um, we were getting ready for lunch when I lived in the rest house and we heard a plane coming over, flew out the back door and a German plane came directly over the house and it must have swooped straight down the high street. It was a cloudy day so I guess he'd lost his way. <laughs> he was trying to... But the planes used to go it. over Marlborough on their way to Coventry when they bombed Coventry. Yes, because um, my daughters were born in 41 and 43 and it was while I was at 5 High Street because I came down for the births of my three children and we used to listen to the planes going over and the, when they bombed Coventry I mean we didn't know they were going to bomb Coventry but we heard about it the next day yeah. Yeah. Well, we used to hear the planes go over going up north south to north and uh you always knew when either London or Bristol got it because all the fire engines used to come hurtling down uh, and there'd be firemen kipping on the ladders and all sorts. Back to you, Peg. Your family have been well-known retailers in the town for generations. Perhaps you could tell us how it all began. My grandfather started the business in 1888 and he borrowed a £1,000 from someone who lived in Kingsbury Street. And my father discovered when he entered the business that it had never been repaid, so he probably <laughs> got that sorted out. And then I don't know when we started Five High Street, which was the ready money shop behind which we lived. 72 High Street was only open when the college came up and at the beginning of every term we took shoes down there cricket boots in the summer term and then rugby and football boots in the winter terms and they all had their school numbers put on in tacks on the sole so as soon as they came in and bought the shoes the workmen in the workshop got them all numbered for the next day with these tacks and it, the shop was only opened it was just the one small room when the college were allowed up the town and they were never allowed further than Hyde Lane in those days. So that's why we had to have the little shop there but it was just the one small room. 
And the shop that you mentioned that was called the Ready Money Shop. Yes, that's Five High Street. Did that go under the Monday's name or was it simply called the Ready Money Shop? The Ready Money Shop, mm. which was the cheap shop and no accounts or anything like that. One time that's it was known yeah. as the um, Gen Shop. We just sold Gen shoes there as far as I can remember and took in repairs. But you mentioned the workshop. We had four men in the workshop. Arthur Shorey worked for us for 60 years, and two of the others worked for us for 50 years. So it was 150 years between these three. What sort of work did they carry out? Well, they, they could make shoes in those days, and repairs. Because, you see, these days they all wear these trainer types, so they don't get repaired. But in those days, it was leather soles and rubber soles, and um, we used to repair them. In fact, Don Harwood, who was a college postman, he used to bring his shoes in for repair every three weeks <laughs> because he walked so far, delivering the college letters all around to the houses. Did you do deliveries as well in collections? Oh, yes. We had two van drivers, and they used to go out five days a week. No, six days a week, Saturday morning. And they went to various places on those 10, 12 journeys. And then the next fortnight, they did them all over again. And when I was widowed in 1960 and I came back, and uh, the uh, drivers, um, if they were on holiday or ill, I used to do the journeys for them. And I knew nothing about the countryside round here in those days because I'd left here when I was 12 and we certainly didn't have a car at that time. So I had to sort of get myself educated about the countryside and then find the houses in the various places. And the first time I did it was in November and I did it for six weeks. And I just had no idea who lived where. It was a nightmare. I used to get back about eight or nine at night. Do you have any particular memories about any notable people that came into the shop? Oh yes, yes. I remember Lord Charles Cavendish, who was a, one of the Aylesbury family. He came in and said to his mother, it must be dreadful to be a shop assistant. And his mother said, no Charles, she said, I would find it very interesting because you meet such a lot of people. And I've never forgotten that. And then her husband used to buy his socks from us, Jaeger socks. And there came a time when they would only supply you if you did a certain amount of trade with them. And Mary Jackson next door had the same trouble with Jaeger clothes. And I remember the Marquis came in and said to Jim, well, where do I get socks now? And um, Jim said, well, you go down to... Heads, Vince Heads, at the bottom of the street. But we had some very, very nice gentry uh, there, but we also had some ones who lorded it over everybody, and she had one of our assistants in tears at one time. And my brother said to this woman, please don't darken our doors again if you're going to behave like that to one of my staff. My brother died in 1980, and my sister-in-law, who never had anything to do with the business at all, she came and, and helped me, and we kept it going until May 1982. I had decided anyway that um, I was four years older than my brother, and I decided that when he was 65, I would give up. And I did give up five weeks after I was 65. And then we sold it to Merchant Ventures, I think it was called. And then it became a flower shop. And it's currently empty. Yes, it is at the minute, I believe. There's still the Monday's sign uh, written in the tiling. Yes, on the end, yes. Which, and is still, they, which is still nice to see, isn't it? They have a, a mat they put over it in the daytime uh, and uh, take it away at weekends. <laughs> Now, you devoted a, a large part of your life to the town's swimming club. In fact, I think it was Ethel Yeomans and yourself that uh, tried your best to get me to float. Oh, did I? Yes. <laughs> when I 
was a lad. Can you sort of tell us a bit about your involvement with Well, um, in 1927, I was present at the old swimming pool when the first sod was cut to build it. And when I was at boarding school in the summer, my father and I went down at 8 o'clock every Sunday morning to swim. And then in the afternoons, they emptied the pool into the river and replaced the water. And it was freezing cold then. From the mains, not back from the river, I tell you. Yes, from, from the river, from I believe. Yes. And then, of course, they got it heated. Yeah. But um, soon after, I can't remember what year it was, I used to help teach down there. I had no qualifications whatsoever. And, of course, these days you can't do that. You have to be qualified now. But um, you helped, didn't you, John? I oh, helped for a while and I even got qualified. I've not drowned yet. No, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> now, can you remember what was on that particular plot of land before the swimming pool? I built? think it was a bit of a market garden, if I remember rightly. But I couldn't be sure about that, Ian. Because at the moment it's a housing development. Oh, yeah, that yes, it's part a town of mill the now. bridge across was part of what they called the rope walk when they made ropes at the factory at the bottom there they used to spin them out and walk the ropes across the river over the footbridge and that's how they used to make ropes must have been a, a path and a, a bridge across somewhere was on the, there the rope works a separate business to the tannery which was right next door oh yeah yeah, yeah. rope works is in the parade wasn't was it morrison's parade. the rope factory it was part of morrison's i think they were in sucking and stuff like that so it's quite an occasion was it the laying of the first sod oh yes and i think mr crosby was mayor at the time if i remember rightly and then of course I used to swim there, as I said, on Sunday mornings. And then when I came back to live in Marlborough in 1960, Bill Winchcombe got me to swim on Friday nights. And then, of course, they heated it. And then um, Bill asked me to be treasurer of the committee that was formed to get the new pool. He said it will only take two and a half years, and it took us nine to get the new pool going but well I haven't swum now for nearly two years because of my back and the fact that I've had two operations but I am a vice president of the swimming club and I was president for five years followed my father yeah, something you've enjoyed as well yeah and I still go to all the galas I don't miss a gala um, back into the high street starting at number one I wondered if you could both take us on a tour of how it used to be. Well, the number bears. one was the Bear Hotel, and number then there two, was. This is going back to the fifties. Was White, who was a decorator's merchant. And number three was Manton Dairy, which is a snack bar owned by G. E. Pocock and so run that. by a Mrs. Fitzgerald, yeah. who came from Ogborn Andrew. Is that what they used to call the milk bar? That's right. Well, there was certainly a grocer's there, because Jack Mead used to work there. Yeah, well, uh, it changed. Yeah. After the grocer's, it yeah. changed to a, a snack bar. And for High Street, of course, was always Cyril and Bernard, which became Halls, which became Jesse Smith. And Cyril and Bernard, they were butchers? Yes. Did they slaughter their own meat? I can't they? tell you that, Ian. Yeah. I think there used to be slaughter houses down the back of that side of the yeah, street. Yeah, uh, Coopers and Webbers used to do it on the uh, top yeah. of the block. There was a, a yard at the back where they used to drive the cattle in prior to being slaughtered. Yeah. Webbers' backyard. And there was a, a bullock or a heifer or something went a bit berserk at the smell of blood. And they couldn't do anything with it. And they got tiny shore to come up from the college with a rifle and shoot it. But he was bemoaning the fact that the thing wouldn't keep still. <laughs> you know, it was the first shot and he got it in the right place, so he dropped it, first shot. Tannery Yard was where the, the another slaughterhouse was and there's uh, old pictures of Marlborough of a gang of blokes burning the uh, pigs 
to get the bristles off. I've uh, taken you slightly off track, haven't I? I think you got up as far as number four. Yeah, well, four. Then we were number five, you see. Yeah. Number then six was, was Aylesbury Arms. It was the old-fashioned place and high ceilings and one thing and that. But, you know, the uh, structure was in such a poor state that when they uh, rebuilt there, they uh, put in a, a steel framework inside the facade to hold it all together. But they kept the original frontage. Number seven, New Swindon Cooperative Society. Yes, yeah, so there was a co-op there. And the other side of Angel Yard, there was Say's. Say's the drapers. Say's was number nine. Yeah. And then there was Chibbers, the jewellers. Ten Butcher, John's the Butcher. Don't remember that. And then you got to Elmer Place. Number 11 was Castle & Co Limited, wine merchants, which was managed by a, a J.H. Connor in those days. 12 and 13 was the Green Dragon. No change there. No. Uh, 14, Bristol Tramways, Bus Office. 15 was the Jolly Butcher. Uh, 16 was Glass, Tobacconist, Mrs. Wiltshire. I went place. to boarding school with her daughter. She was also educated at the school down the road, at the high school. And Joy, I believe, is still alive and living in Collingbourne. Her mother was widowed at a very early age, I should think, because I don't ever remember her husband at all. But she lived with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Glass, her parents, and I used to go and play down there. Riding school yard? Yes. Now, what was down in riding school yard? Ledleys of Marlborough, builders. But they moved, of course, straight over to the other side, Chantry Lane. 17, of course, was the cinema. I must tell you about cinema. I think it was just after my daughter was married. Her husband was home on leave from the Merchant Navy, and we went to see a film, and it was bitterly cold in there, and I turned to them and said, cool, I could do with a hot toddy. The next thing on was Rishi had gone over to the castle and brought, and brought me back a hot toddy, <laughs> which is the most acceptable. Just before you move on, I understand that Waitrose used to be the old fire station at one Yes, it did. It was the old yeah. fire station. Yes, yes. And um, how did they used to call for the firemen in those days? Because obviously there weren't any radios. Well, the well, you, fire bell was on top of the town hall. The uh, horses were in a paddock on the other side of the high street. And they just opened the gate and the horses knew where to go, trotted down the yard and across the high street and waited to be harnessed up outside the... Uh... They got there before the firemen, didn't they? <laughs> In some cases, yeah. <laughs> 18, Southern Fine Laundry. Uh, 19 was Bennett's Grocers, which was D. Pocock. Don Pocock. Roughly yeah. what year are we talking about with all these jobs? 51. And then the other side, Mrs. Hillier lived, who taught me. And she used to keep pigeons. She loved pigeons. Her house was so smelly. Pigeons everywhere. Uh, 25 was Stratton's. What do you remember about Stratton's? The coffee shop. Well, the smell of coffee. And then there was the yard, and then the main shop. Uh, the Prudential Assurance Company was in there as well. 26 and 27, Poly Tea Rooms. Miss J. McLeod... Miss J. Leith Hay. That's right. And they made my wedding cake. They were lovely ladies. They really were lovely ladies. This was in 1939, of course, when they made my wedding cake. Certainly. There were three of them in there. Yes, there? there was another one. I can't think I can't of her name, but she name. was never very prominent. 35 was what we used to call Weber's Bottom Shop. E. H. Weber Butcher. Where the photo shop is now. Yeah. yeah. Only Mrs. Webber used to run that with a rod of steel. 36, 37 was Merlin Tea Rooms. 38 is also Merlin Tea Rooms. And you go on to 40. Morris, Dr. J, Isbury House. The Surgery, 41. 
Morris EC, Morris, Dr. WB, Lauren House, that's 42, Ivy House, 43, Wellington Arms, number 46, 47, 48 was Vince Head, the Taylors, uh, 49, Mason Joyce, ladies hairdressers. That's right. 84 and 85, St. Peter's Cafe. 91 is St. Peter's Boys School. 96, County Court Office. 99, Pope, agricultural implement maker. He used to live over the shop. A relation of my sister-in-law. Uh, number 100 was Ledley, antique dealer. 101, I post know. office. I don't. 102 and 3, Russell J and Abe, tailors and outfitters. 104, 5, 6, freeze, house furnishing, cabinet makers and undertakers. 108, Gail JW, printer. Yes, I remember that. 109, Marlborough Wine Store, ushers. Yeah. Uh, Georgian restaurant, that's what yes, I was the told. Yes, That was the donut dugout. The Yanks used to go in there a lot during the war. 110A was Central Garage, Herd and Leaders. Right, 111, Royal Oak. 112, Tiny Tots, Children's Clothes, Miss M. Hutchins. She was yeah. a cub mistress, wasn't yeah, she? Yeah, she was, yeah. No, I think she was cubs. Cubs, I she? think. Mrs. Wright at 113, confectioner. That's where Dudley's... David Dudley. Mm. Duck, 114, cycle agent, toys. Napton, 115, pastry cook and bakers. Uh, 116, conservative club, which you obviously know about. Castle and Ball, 117 and 18. 119, Flux and Co, booksellers and stationers. And Dr. Wheeler lived over the top, I believe. 120, Dunford, confectioner, tobacconist and bootmaker. How about that? That's a good isn't it? Yeah. yeah. 121, 122, Salisbury, W.E., Eric J. Free, Radio, Music and Electrical Appliances. 123, Archard, that was hairdressing, both ladies and gentlemen. 124 was Burgess, T. and Son, Fruiterers and Florists. And Lloyds Bank. Yeah. 126, Owen and Co., Accountants. Changed, is it? No, that's Stanbrook architect and surveyor. That's right. Register of births and deaths. 127 international tea stores. Yes, the international stores. And that's changed a few times. Yeah. 128 Marlborough tea rooms, guest house, Mrs. A. Kerr. That's right. Where, what is that? Woolworths? 130 again, Hooper, Pinnegar and Co. Auctioneers, valuers, state agents. 131, Boots the Chemist. Yes. 132, W.H. Smith, which is now Merchant House. Which was Lucy's, where Mother yeah. worked. What did Lucy's use to 133 Station. was Baker's R.H. Chemist. That's right. An optician. 135. I was in hospital. Dale & Co., Ironmongers. Yeah. Summerfield. Summerfield. 136 <laughs> White Horse Bookshop. Yeah, Miss Watson and Miss Barton. Yeah. They started the White Horse Bookshop. When I was a child, it was a sweet shop. That's 137 right. was James's, Wireless and Electric Electrical. Engineers. Yeah. 138 was Ministry of National Insurance and the Food Office. 138 Women's Voluntary Services, County Office and Citizens of Voice Office. That's right. 139, Melbourne and Phillips Limited, China Glass Hardware. 140, Herds, Boot and Shoe Warehouse. Competition for you, Kate. No, not really. 141 is a middle, Midland Bank, which was Phillips the Ironmonger before that. 
142 Henry Turner, gun maker and cycle agent. That's seven at travel now and they had some alterations done and opened up a flap which led down to the cellar and it was full of old bikes and scrap iron and all sorts of rubbish down there old Henry Turner had left behind. 143 Armandy, 144 Ernie Collier, watchmaker and jeweller. You know uh, Eric Cook? <laughs> he always used to tell the tale about Ernie Collier. He used to, on a wet day, he used to sit in the back of the shop counting his sovereigns. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're finished now. Well, thank you for that, John. That was great. The bend in the high street is caused because they had to build onto solid ground and keep back from the water meadows on the lower side. That's why there's a dog's leg twist. And it's only really if you stand outside the library and look up the Well, a really good know. if you get a trip up the top of St Peter's, Peter's Church, Church sometimes, you, you can really see it'll it. give you all that dope and, uh, you know, you can yeah. see the curve. In other parts of the town, how do you think it's changed most of all in your lifetime? If you look at the... Uh, 1899 map you'll find all the housing estates that are like St Margaret's Mead especially were all allotments and I uh, see on here it shows where all the isolation hospitals were in the, the uh, rest house was built as an isolation hospital by the Aylesbury estate and uh, if you drive through towards Great Bedwin off the A4, you can see the same mansard-type roof on the building up at Timbridge Farm. And I often wondered whether that was an isolation hospital for the estate, and then they built a second one for Marlborough. Now that closed in 1871, I believe, and it was moved to the top of what are now is Lane is Close and was situated in the bungalow, which was a cast iron structure. When Lane is Close was built, that closed down and the isolation hospital became the one behind the old workhouse up on the common, a new brick structure which I don't think was well, very rarely used. Just to round off, is there anything else you'd like to share with us? Or perhaps you could say how the town you think has changed most in your lifetimes? Well, there's an awful lot of building gone on, of course, with the estates, you see. Yeah, well, as I say, in the map, any allotments, they're all building estate. Yeah. Yes. Now, you see, the Stonebridge Close, that was all allotments originally. Were the allotments purely for personal use, or were they... No, they, they used, used to... to they used to... Gardens? Yeah, market gardens keep the town in vegetables. Yes, well, Hillier's did that, didn't they? Mm. Where was Hillier's market garden? Well, I think where what is now Town Mill. There was a market garden there. Yeah, the market gardens all over the places. Old Burgess had one along Tin Pit. Yes, he did. But Hillier's the shop was in the parade. In fact, there were two. Bottom of the, well, they, they also... I tell you were where there was another one, John. Next door to what was Redwoods. Yeah. The it's old, now the cancer the old, shop. I think it's almost time to come to a close now. It's okay. starting to get dark. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the tape's running out, but can I say it's been fascinating talking to you both. Oh, it's a pleasure. I knew that you'd find John interesting, because he's like that. His head is full of all this useful information. information. <laughs> useless information, if you like, but it's been useful tonight, I think, yeah, hasn't it? Glad you've enjoyed it, anyway. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.